Hello, uh, I'm Eleni of Sathiu and I'm a medical oncologist focused on GU medical oncologist, some of you know, with my, of course, main focus being prostate cancer. And I'm joined by two colleagues who do not need a lot of introduction. They're superstars in our field, uh, Dr. Oliver Sartor. I start, they're both gentlemen, medical oncologists, Dr. Oliver Sartor. I start because he's more of a neighbor to me, he's closer. And then I go more to the north, to Dr. Fred Saad, um, a urologist that I'm also inclined to say urologist slash medical oncologist from, from uh, Canada. So we are joining you to discuss the exciting data that is coming through this June. And it feels also that we're coming out of the pandemic and it's like those movies that were not released but are being released now and there's a lot of hype around them. And I will actually start with the one that was the data that was most expected of all, the vision study data. I think we were just all sitting on the edge of the seat listening to what was coming through. And I will actually ask Dr. Sartor, who is the co-PI of the trial, to give us an overview and his first thoughts. And then Dr. Sat, who's also an investigator on the trial, give us kind of a view of the future on PSMA lutetian. Oliver, to you. All right. Thank you, Eleni. You know, really exciting data from Vision. Um, it, for those who are not very familiar, let me give, give a little bit of a sketch of the, of the trial and then, then the overview of the results. So Vision utilizes an agent called PSMA 617 Lutetium 177. That's a bit of a mouthful, and I'll just call it PSMA Lutetium. And as it turns out, this molecule is going to be tracking the PSMA in the cells and going to those cells and delivering lutetium-177, which is a beta emitter, and that is a therapeutic isotope. So the idea, just like PSMA scanning, which I think most people are going to be familiar with, you're going to not only visualize the cells, you're going to treat the cells. So where did this trial start? It started in the very difficult to treat patients. It started for patients who had already been treated with ADT and progressed, had already been treated with abiraterone or enzalutamide and progressed, had already been treated with a taxane and progressed, maybe even two taxane and progressed. So these are extremely difficult to treat patients. There's a lot of controversy over what the control arm ought to be. Should it be chemotherapy? And the decision was no, it should not be chemotherapy because most of these patients had already had chemotherapy and for them to get a second chemotherapy or even a third chemotherapy wasn't necessarily appropriate. So it decided to bring the control arm into quote standard of care, which would be anything you could you wanted to do as an investigator except for chemotherapy. And the patients were randomized two to one to receive standard of care plus or minus the Lutetium 177 and with that design, the RPFS, the radiographic progression-free survival, and the overall survival were the co-primary endpoints. Both of them were strikingly positive. Uh, the overall survival, the most important one, has a hazard ratio of 0 0.62. And it turned out that you prolonged the median uh, overall survival by about four months. Doesn't sound like a lot, but then there's some patients who truly, truly benefited. And then the RPFS, well, has a hazard ratio of 0.5, so it had the risk of progression. And the side effect profile was really quite good. There's a little bit of dry mouth, there's a little bit of mild suppression, but not much. But overall, it was a strikingly positive study, will be presented plenary at ASCO, and a New England Journal manuscript is, is going to be pending. So I don't know, Fred, what did you think? You, you, were, you were part of the, the crew that, uh, in the investigators. Uh, what was your impression? Yeah, well, well, you know, exactly like you're saying, I mean, we've been listening and hearing about lutetium for years. And, and it, it's striking that it took this long to do a phase three study and to prove the utility. So, you know, I was very happy with vision. We were part of the trial um, and it was wonderful to be able to offer something to, some, to people, like you say, that were really at the end of the road. Basically, the options were limited, if any, were left for those patients. And the patients we put in, um, you know, we have at least one that is in complete remission for over two and a half years. And he was in the eighth line of treatment. Um, and, and so he's become really a poster boy for, for, for research of what, what can be achieved. And he's actually gone back to work. He had stopped working. Um, and so you do have these outstanding responses. 
you know, the question is, do we always need to wait this long? So I think, you know, you and I are, and, and, and Eleni are involved in, in, in helping move this earlier in the disease continuum where, you know, there's more of an opportunity to capture patients uh, and, and maybe help them when there's, when there's more of an opportunity. A lot of these patients were so sick coming into the study that it was maybe too little, too late for some patients. Yeah. Actually, let me mention something I should have mentioned before, and that is the PSMA selection. So in order to be- well, that, That's what trial, I was gonna ask you. Yeah, no, no, and, and I'm sorry, I, I neglected that in the yeah. first part. Um, PSMA selection, so everybody had to get a PSMA PET in order to be determined eligible for the trial. And there were certain criteria that would exclude you in if you're PSMA PET positive in a metastatic lesion. And these would be, lymph node lesions that were 2.5 centimeters or greater that were PSMA negative, or if you had a visceral lesion that was one centimeter and PSMA negative. So there were exclusions, but the interesting bottom line is 87% of the patients who were scanned were actually eligible for the study. So even though there was PSMA selection, the vast majority were actually eligible for the study and were randomized. So I like, and I wanted to make a comment on that, uh, Oliver, I like that that the approach was not to be purists, unlike the case for the data that we've seen from Dr. Hoffman, but with that in mind, do you think either of you, based on your experience, that there may be an opportunity to tease out these amazing magical stories like the one that uh, Fred described by combining modalities and trying to just hone in into the less heterogeneous when it comes to PSMA expression. I mean, we, we need to find the, the, the greatest responders and come on in earlier. You know, we're gonna be looking at some sub-analyses on that. And, and I suspect that we will be able to pick out some of these better responders by using more stringent criteria. But again, when you have a hazard ratio of 0.62 for survival, 0.5 for RPFS, we obviously did it right. Can you do it better? I suspect so. And can you combine something like the circulating tumor DNA? Can you look at genomic alterations? I suspect that we're gonna learn a great deal more about this therapy as we go forward. This is a first shot, and the good news is it's a positive shot. Uh, can we do better? I suspect we can, yes. I just wanna to remind to the audience that this, uh, and it was pointed out by both our speakers here, that this is a trial that was tested in the far end of all modalities, very similar to, if some of you recall, the negative studies that we have had coming in through with cabozantinib for, for multiple reasons, not criticizing the agent, but it speaks to how potent it can be and potentially put in earlier. But I would agree that at this point, we should say no patient left behind and given the opportunity, if so. And back to Fred's point, I think that the German group had been working for years on it, but they had not done it in such a regimented fashion, such as phase three. They were showing us more retrospective data, but now we have, as you said, more the doubling of RPFS, very, very impressive data in such a sick uh, group of patients. So let's, let me consider that, again, going back to my movie analogy, that vision is kind of the new, Avenger superhero with PSMA lutetium coming in. But let's talk a little bit about the new data coming in from ACES, where I would say, you know, androgen signal inhibition still remains Iron Man and we won't lose Iron Man. But um, I was part of this trial, full disclosure, the ACES trial, but I was particularly intrigued by the data that I would like Fred to describe to us when it comes to subgroups, where we can potentially tease out who are these men where we should potentially maximize the combinatorial strategies because that's what we want to tackle today. Yeah, so so thanks, Eleni. So ACES really was addressing the point. So it's, it's almost the other extreme in MCRPC than vision, right? So this is first line MCRPC, never had any treatment before um, and, and, and really tried to build on the success of this trials with abiraterone, with enzalutamide in the MCRPC setting where rather than going sequential that we know doesn't do much in terms of real positive outcomes is using the approach of combination upfront, where maybe in a hormonally based approach, we have the biggest opportunity to make a difference. And now with the non-metastatic CRPC trials, 
with the metastatic hormone sensitive, we're really realizing that if you do it right early on, you really have a long-term impact in these patients. And so ACES was actually a positive study. The endpoint was RPFS. And this was actually improved by over 30% when combined abiraterone with apalutamide compared to a control arm that was actually abiraterone, which is the standard of care. So just by combining two uh, AR-targeted therapies, we did much better in terms of RPFS. We almost doubled. We actually increased it by seven months. So this is not a placebo. This is against abiraterone. Uh, but unfortunately, in terms of overall survival, the trial wasn't powered to look at overall survival. It was less than 1,000 patients with a control arm that is not a placebo. So actually, every trial that's shown success in survival was compared against nothing. So, you know, it, it's a really high bar in an all-comer population. But having said that, we had pre-planned looking at some more difficult patients to treat. And one of those subgroups are patients over 75, where we know these patients come in, are usually not really considered for chemotherapy, are looking for other options. And when they fail, at least in Canada, less than 20% actually go on to chemotherapy. And, and, and so these patients who were put into the trial, and there were about 350 patients over 75, and we realized that the RPFS was strikingly different as expected because it, it, it mimicked even better than the overall group. But in overall survival, that subgroup actually had a significant improvement. It was a seven month improvement in overall survival in those patients, which actually turned out to be with the limitations of a subgroup, statistically significant. Um, and so, you know, uh, there are multiple reasons why those those outcomes were better, probably because they got less subsequent therapy, but I think it shows the importance of, of trying to treat these patients optimally because a lot of these patients, their first line is often their only line. And, and, and hopefully trials like vision will give them another opportunity that is not chemotherapy-based, where unfortunately the reality is a lot of these patients are just not getting chemotherapy. Yeah. So look you know, into Fred, the future, I, I, right, Oliver? I was sorry, I was going to get to you also with your comment and a look into the future, because we're speaking to combinations, and the vision trial did have standard of care plus, mm -hmm. and now we're looking at ACEs. What is the future, and especially for the elderly patients, who are our are our patients usually? Yeah. So you know, in the future, I, I hope we'll be able to offer this kind of of approach rather than the sequential that we know really doesn't add much in terms of progression or or, or definitely not in terms of survival. Um, you know, would it make sense to start this kind of approach in the metastatic hormone sensitive patient uh, that's elderly? Uh, you know, th th there are a lot of maybe opportunities. Uh, but obviously, it's not as sexy as a new drug, right? I mean, it's coming back to what's been working and continues to work really well in, in most of our patients. Oliver. You know, one of the things that I think it emphasizes the importance of getting these novel agents in sooner. And one of the abstracts that we're not going to be discussing was to look across the board and sort of a, a standard of care, real world experience in the US. And there's so many patients just being treated with ADT up front. And there's unequivocal data with, you know, not only with apalutamide, with abiraterone, with enzalutamide, bringing these new hormones up front gives maximum benefit to the patients. And we somehow have to get that word out a little bit better because I'm disappointed. And I still see the community docs at times just putting people on ADT. And, and that's not the standard of care today. It's absolutely heartbreaking. And, uh, and especially since here in the US, we, we already have generic forms of enhanced androgen inhibition. Um, but thank you for grounding us. But let's, let's actually move on since we are speaking to combinations. And I know it's a, it's a matter that is close to all of our hearts, but sometimes we go the extra step ignoring that there, it, might, it might backfire since they are elderly patients and they do get side effects such as loss of bone density, osteoporosis and other events with the protracted exposure to the agents we've used. With that in mind, I'd like, I'd like you, Oliver, and then Fred to, to give us your thoughts on whether this presentation on ERRTC133 that is addressing again the combinatorial strategies 
when it comes to androgen signal inhibition plus radiopharmaceuticals, specifically in this case, enzalutamide and radium-223, but it could apply across the board, whether in your mind it, it rectifies and puts back on the map the possibility of combinatorial strategies to that effect. You know, I'm, I'll wait off and then de defer to Fred. You know, we we have ideas that being able to combine therapies should be better, but we have in prostate cancer a lot of data where that doesn't turn out to be the case. And certainly with docetaxel, we've had a hard time improving upon docetaxel alone. So the Area 223 trial looked at abiraterone and radium in combination and turned out to be a negative study. This is with enzalutamide. And one of the interesting things here is that number one is we don't really know if combination is better or not, but the use of bone health agents had a dramatic effect. And I'm gonna turn it over to Fred because he's very, very familiar with the bone targeted uh, agents and their impact. And I don't know, Fred, this is a dramatic effect in terms of bone targeted agents. Why don't, why don't we hear from you? Yeah, so, so you know, it's good when you learn lessons from trials that have not only failed, but have actually looked like they were harming patients when you started combining therapies without thinking about the bone. And so, you know, the, the, the ERA223 that you mentioned, uh, the, uh, many patients didn't get a bone targeted supportive agent. Um, and so when EORTC was going on, they recognized very early that patients who didn't get a bone targeted therapy had a very high fracture rate, very similar to what we were seeing in ERA223. And, and the fracture rate was not only in patients on radium, it was actually very high in patients uh, on the combination of radium and enzalutamide, but even with enzalutamide alone. And, and I think none of us would think enzalutamide is a cause of fracture, but it just reflects that if you follow patients on ADT that have metastatic CRPC, are getting subsequent therapy that are keeping them well, the fracture rate was actually around 30%. And they quickly turned around and said, it's an obligation to give a bone supportive agent in combination. And in this case, most of them are getting denosumab or zoledronic acid. Um, and when they did that, it plummeted to zero fracture rate. And so it's amazing uh, that, that we're still talking about this 15 years after or 20 years after the data supported uh, the need for bone targeted therapy in the MCRPC setting. And so this data that's gonna report is not gonna tell us that it's better to combine radium and enzalutamide, but is continuing to reinforce the fact that we need to think about bone supportive agents in patients who are on long-term ADT and are now uh, in the MCRPC state. Thank you for that comment. And I think it points to the fact that we as physicians in our clinics need to be very mindful of these events since our patients are quite elderly and are being uh, potentially having an expedition of their aging process through the use of androgen signaling inhibitors, which we would all agree. Um, with that in mind, let's go to the inverse. Um, there's a lot of hype, a lot of excitement about the cycling of testosterone. I mean, patients love the idea, of course. Uh, and it's an ongoing theme for a few years now within the context of small trials. I believe it started within the Hopkins group, exciting scientific rationale. And of course, when something is trendy and sexy, it, it gains traction. There was a small study, though multi-institutional, presenting BAT plus nivolumab. We got, I, I want a short comment from Oliver on what your thoughts are on the future of this approach. Or is there a so, future? So first of all, that uh, bipolar energy therapy, and yes, the Hopkins guys definitely get a shout out, Sam Damien in particular. And what they demonstrated is that there's a subset of men who may actually benefit, but it's after the use of an abiraterone or enzalutamide type agent, uh, not after ADT alone, certainly not in the upfront setting. Uh, unfortunately, I've had many misunderstandings arise on, on the part of patients. They hear, well, testosterone is good for prostate cancer. Why do I have to undergo something like luprolide or enzalutamide, you know, which blocks the antigen? And I think it's very, very important to know that these are highly selective patients. I, I do use some in my own practice, but it's only for people that if things go wrong, that I still have a bit of a runway and they won't get into trouble. I mean, certainly if they have, you know, multiple bony metastases that are painful, I mean, no way would I be introducing this therapy. This is typically for the low volume patient who might be progressing on abirenzo, 
and then possibly under close supervision to be able to follow. Now, the briefly on the on the bat combined with uh, the, the PD-1 antagonist, um, response rate by PSA did get up to about 40%, which is interesting, but the duration was not per particularly prolonged. I, I think we need to learn a lot more. We need to learn about patient selection. We need to educate patients. This is not for everybody. And we need to be able to do more trials before we can really sort of say, this is something that ought to be out in community practice. I don't know, be, Fred, I'd be interested in your opinion as well and uh, agree, disagree. No, I totally agree. I mean, we're having the same situation. So, so, so I think we have to really reinforce that this is purely investigational, really small studies, and really not ready for people to be doing this in their clinics uh, to try to help patients that, are, that really need not only castration, but super castration that has shown to improve survival and outcomes of these patients. This is where the e-cancer group is going to put on the bottom, do not try it at home kind of, of disclosure. So with that in mind, actually, Fred, I'm going to come back to you with a final comment from the clinical side of things, purely clinical. I really like trials that are making the effort to get the view of patients in a objective way. And the ADENSA trial uh, is one such that was conducted to actually ask the patient and get their thoughts, again, in an objective way, whether they would prefer an androgen signaling inhibitor such as enzalutamide versus the more novel darolutamide, which is expected to have a, let's say, better profile of safety when it comes to adverse events that are mainly related with passing the, bla the blood-brain barrier. Your thoughts on the results and maybe give a little bit of a description of the results. Yeah, so, so, so I think the, the, the concept is, is novel. Um, it, to try to really, like you say, address the quality of life issues of these therapies that really have a benefit for patients um, with advanced disease. So uh, I think what we learn is that, that there is a difference. It's not significant, the difference between the two, which, which I was actually surprised. I thought patients would, would clearly do much better on darolutamide than enzalutamide based on, on all of this intriguing uh, uh, suggestion that it doesn't go through the blood-brain barrier. Um, there was a little bit of a difference, uh, but we recognize that when you do things properly, th there was you know, a little bit of fatigue, more fatigue than we would have expected with the darolutamide. So none of these agents are free of adverse events. And I think it's our job to try to decide which patient is more appropriately treated with which drug. And, and I would agree, you know, the more elderly, the more frail patient uh, does experience more fatigue, um, probably a little bit more with enzalutamide. And so we have to be careful. One, is there an indication to treat? And two, what, what treatment we, we decide to use? And, and specifically for that patient that is sitting across the table, across, uh, you know, in our clinic with us. But, but I want to move on and, and turn to Oliver. You know, since, since the profound study came in and it actually launched the era of precision medicine from the standpoint of molecular correlates, to determine which agent or therapeutic strategy we should use. But we have ways away from getting to the final product that will be the deliverable for each and every patient. But there's a lot of now productivity, creativity in the field, pointing more and more to the advent of new methodologies and more correlates that may determine these responses. Now, in our prep uh, visit before this discussion, Oliver, you pointed to one of the presentations that actually spoke with regard to circulating tumor DNA fraction and how it may predict the clinical outcomes. Um, if you would like to speak more to how you see the future evolving, it's not a ready to use assay, but there is something to be expected, maybe in midterm, maybe three to five years from now. Uh, what are your thoughts? Yeah, so, you know, really, really quite interesting. Uh, this is an abstract of the Canadian group, uh, led by Kim Chi and colleagues at, in Vancouver. And what I'll say is that they looked at circulating tumor DNA, just not with regard to the particular alteration, but just simply what was the percentage of circulating tumor DNA. And what they found was that the percentages matter. And they put it in multivariate analysis, and it came out important. 
What this tells me is that there's more to the story. Yes, we can look at the patient, we can talk about their age, we can talk about the visceral meds, we can talk about how high the PSA is or their alphas, but understanding the circulating tumor DNA percentage may in fact provide additional value in terms of prognosis. And it's not predictive, and I think we're gonna have a lot more work in this area, but I was a bit intrigued because the multivariate analysis did show a current with survival, and particularly what I call the outliers, those with either a low percentage or a high percentage, they use 30% as a cutoff for high and 2% for low. There's a dramatic difference in terms of overall survival. So this is something we need to be aware of, and to be able to move it into more trials going forward in order to understand the circumstances and predictive value. Excellent. So again, something that is still early, we have to have the assay well tested and validated, whichever is going to be used. This is not part of the discussion today, but I think that the main take home message from this ASCO meeting this year which I hope is gonna be the last one to be virtual. And by the way, at ESMO, we're all moving into live, at least a hybrid. So I look forward to seeing you all there. Uh, but with that in mind, I think we got in 2021, some really exciting data regarding the addition of a newcomer, a new therapeutic agent. We're gonna hear soon from the, of course, federal drug administrations across the world regarding the approval and availability. Moreover, we're trying to tease out in combinatorial strategies, how we can make it safer and better, selecting subgroup of patients that may get most of the benefit. And there's so much more to come with regard to the determination of molecular correlates that are of value to our patients' treatments. But I think the excitement is there and the momentum is right for us to continue our work, all of us across the world. Thank you very much for being a part of these discussions and look forward to seeing you soon again.